Okay then. So the goal of this talk is to give a very high level overview of the Boost ASIO library, talk about which concepts it has that are important to its async model, and then introduce C++ 20 coroutines and how they work in, in that model. Um, finally, I'll show links to a lot of places where we use ASIO and Ceph, and that'll kind of tie into some of the examples that we go through. Uh, there should be plenty of time for Q&A at the end, but you should also feel free to interrupt me uh, unmuting and asking questions uh, if you need clarification on anything. So to get started, uh, what is the ASIO library? First and foremost, it's a networking library. It uh, has cross-platform abstractions for sockets, streams, and buffers, along with some other stuff like file I.O. and timers. Um, but it's also a very flexible asynchronous runtime that, um, that supports async networking uh, very well. So it can be run single-threaded or multi-threaded. We'll talk more about that. Um, part of the flexibility is that async operations can complete in a lot of different ways, whether via callbacks or futures or coroutines. We'll see a lot of examples there too. Uh, and finally, it's a header-only C++ template library. So when I talk about the flexibility that's generally enabled through templates, and as a result, templates can be kind of hard to work with, hard to understand. So if you've seen ASIO code that looked like a horrible mess, I completely understand. But the goal of this talk is to help get you more comfortable with the, the um, with kind of the, the concepts that are behind it. So finally, I'll point out that the, the documentation of the library is excellent. It has a very complete reference and an overview that has a lot of good descriptions about these concepts too. I'll have um, several links, especially to examples as we go. So to get started, I think it's really useful just to think about the ASIO IO context as a work queue. Um, pretty much any ASIO program is going to set up an IO context, schedule a bunch of work on it, and then run that IO context until everything is done. So in this example, we post two lambdas to this work queue. That just schedules them in the queue. And then when we call CTX run, that runs each of these functions in order to produce the hello world text. So this is an example of asynchrony, being able to schedule two things at the same time and let them run. Another simple example is connecting to a remote TCP server. Here we have the IO context again and a socket that wraps it. And then we call this async connect function to do the connection that starts the work. And then we call ctx.run to actually run everything. And that will wait until everything completes. Here we're passing a lambda as the callback argument to async connect. So when it completes, we'll either get its error code or a successfully opened connection. So like the example above, you could imagine starting async connect against several servers and running them all at the same time since it's asynchronous. On to the next example where I said that the IO context could be single or multi-threaded. Here's an example of spawning several threads to call CTX run at the same time. If we schedule a lot of work on the IO context, then all of the threads that are calling run will be able to take off work and execute it. So this is essentially a, a thread pool servicing the work queue. And these threads will be able to join 
once all of the work is done and run returns. So the, the takeaways from these examples, run always blocks until all of its work is done. You might schedule a couple things, but those things might schedule more work. And so run will continue working until everything is done. Run is a blocking function, unlike the async ones because of this. A single thread can run multiple concurrent async jobs, and you can scale that up with multiple threads by just calling run from multiple threads. So the IO context, or more generally the execution context, is kind of the base building block of all of the async stuff in ASIO. Before I move on, any questions? All right, on to some of the concepts that make up this model. First one is the completion token. So this is the, the final argument to any async function. For example, above we passed a lambda function as the completion token. And this specifies how the caller should be signaled when the operation completes. So the simplest kind is a callback function um, but it's very flexible, and um, let's see, the, the callback function in this case took an error code, but different operations may have different signatures for their completion. They may error, but for example, async read might also return the number of bytes that it read, and each operation is going to document what the expected completion signature is. So looking at the docs for async connect, it says that it's just the error code. So you can always find the, uh, this is something that each of the async functions will specify itself. Looking at the completion token documentation, it shows ex several examples. This is the async read sum function. Like I said, it's the error code and then a size type of the number of bytes that it read. Next is an example of using use future as a completion token. Sorry, are you guys able to read this text or is it too small? Hopefully that's better. So in this case, we're calling the same async read sum function, except the use future completion token converts the function into one that returns a standard future or boost future. I forget. I think it's standard future as the return type. So you can call, call it this way to initiate the operation. It'll give you a future back, and then you can call future get to actually block on its completion and where we saw that the function signature was an error code and a size type, the future just returns the size type. And if there's an error, it, the get function will throw that as an exception. So already we see that these completion tokens can make significant changes to how the function works. And that's part of the kind of magic of templates here. Um, next is the use a waitable completion token, which is the, um, the way to use C++20's coroutines. So here we can use the co-wait keyword to wait for this async function to complete. And again, we get the size type back with errors being thrown as exceptions. Final example is the stackful coroutines that RGW has been making a lot of use of. When you pass the yield context as a completion token, then calling the async function will suspend that coroutine until it completes, and then resume it with the return value. So those are the important examples of completion tokens. Um, they're very powerful, but generally you're, you know, using one type or another fairly consistently. Like if you're in coroutines, then you're just using one form. 
you're using futures, then it's just the other. So pretty much all of the async functions provided by ASIO will support all of these different methods. Um, there's also some adapters for the, those completion tokens we talked about. For example, you can use the redirect error one, which will capture error codes from that completion into a variable instead of throwing them. That can be useful. There's also as tuple, which converts the function signature. So instead of getting multiple arguments, you get a tuple of them. There's also bind executor and bind cancellation slot, which also modify how the completion happens. And we'll talk about those lower. So the completion tokens are all about instructing the library and how to notify you about the completion. The next concept is the executor. And simply, this is just a handle to an execution context like IO context. So you can call get executor on the IO context, and it'll return an executor of the given type. So pretty much all of ASIO's IO objects, like the sockets and timers, take the executor. So any, any work that you schedule on them will run on that executor and complete on it by, de by default. And the IO objects will expose the get executor function to return that back. Um, so when you call an async member function on that object, the completion token will be associated with its default executor. But the bind executor adapter can cause the completion to be scheduled on a different executor instead. That can be useful sometimes, especially if you are working with strands, which is up next. Hey, Jane, if you have a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So IO context is an execution context to our executor. And what the difference between the execution context and the executor? What's the relationship? Yeah, so IO context is the execution context. Um, it's kind of the heavyweight object that you have generally just a small number of that are shared between a lot of different things. And then the executors are just handles to an underlying execution context. OK, got it. Thank you. OK, so the strand executor is a special kind that wraps another type of executor and provides an additional guarantee that only one of its handlers will run at a time. So if you're using a multi-threaded IO context and you just schedule work on those executors, they may race to run on different threads. And when that is not safe, you can use a strand executor to essentially ensure that only one can run at a time. Even if they run on different threads, they'll be synchronized that way. If you're using a single threaded execution context, that's already guaranteed. So you can add strands, but they're not necessary in that case. Uh, so going back to the initial hello world example we saw above, here we're using a different kind of execution context called the thread pool running with four threads. If we just posted two jobs to that directly, we wouldn't have any guarantee that they would run in order. But by making a strand on that execution context, we can schedule work on the strand and get that guarantee. So this will always produce hello and then world. So multi-threaded applications can be very complicated uh, with, with mutexes and atomics. Um, in ASIO, if you make careful use of strands, you can generally avoid the need for that. Uh, an example from RGW, 
is that the beast front end, when it accepts a connection, it will spawn a coroutine on a strand. And so that coroutine can go off and spawn other work on the same strand and share memory without worrying about thread races. So that's a very, I think it's an elegant way to, to get thread safety in complicated asynchronous programs. Any questions on strands? I think this is a really important concept. All right, moving on. There's also ASIO's NEIO executor, which is a type erased executor. Generally, um, a lot of the ASIO objects take an executor as a template parameter which means that if you put it on one executor type, you can't use it with a strand, for example. But if it uses any IO executor as its executor type, then you can essentially use any executor that you want with it. Um, it's very nice. We are using that in RGW, and we did a lot of performance measurement and saw essentially no overhead from the type erasure. So that's very nice. It can uh, eliminate the need for a lot of templates in, in users' code. Um, quick, quick, quick question here. Could uh -huh. you give an example? Can, could you give an example of like different executor types? Yeah, so the, the IO context executor is one. The ASIO strand is another. Uh, here we have a thread pool execution context. So calling get executor on that would give its own executor type. So it's it's different types, but they're all just handles to their executor, if that makes sense. Okay. And what would be the, let's say, the relationship between a thread pool and IO context? Is thread pool using IO context internally, or is it? They completely unrelated. Um, I'm not sure if it uses it internally, but it provides pretty much all of the same guarantees, except that it's multi-threaded by default. Unlike IO context. Right. OK, thank you. OK, so I'm ready to move on to coroutines if there are no more questions about the, the ASIO stuff so far. All right. So C++ added support for coroutines, along with these three keywords, co-await, co-yield, and co-return. So any function that uses one or more of those keywords is a coroutine function. Um, the only other requirement is that its return type is an awaitable type. Um, the C++20 did not come with any pre-made awaitable types. So it's up to libraries to implement their own. Um, and that's outside the scope of this talk, but Luckily, ASIO provides a good one in ASIO awaitable T. So here, there's a function that co-returns 42, and its return type is an awaitable int, meaning that it's a coroutine function that pr produces integer values. And the way that you run a coroutine function is with the ASIO cospawn function. So this is another asynchronous function. The last argument is the completion token. If the coroutine function throws an exception, you get an exception pointer to that. Otherwise, you get its return value. If it's an awaitable void, then you just don't get the second argument. Um, so interestingly, we're actually calling this coroutine function here rather than just passing a pointer to it. Um, what happens when you first call the coroutine function is that 
it starts suspended, but still returns an awaitable object so that you can co-await on that or spawn it. And so when you co-spawn a coroutine on an executor, it will kind of package it up in an awaitable, ship that to the executor, and then resume the coroutine there. So coroutines in ASIO are closely tied to their, the executors that you spawn them on. And that gives you good control about which threads they run on, whether they need to share memory across threads with strand executors, and so on. And like the above examples, nothing actually starts running until you call run on the IO context. And so that on the executor resumes the coroutine function, which just coroutines 42, sorry, co-returns 42. We see that argument here and we print it to the console. So as you co-spawn is essentially the way to get into C++ 20 coroutine land from the outside. But once you are inside a coroutine, for example, a parent coroutine, you can just co-await calls to other coroutines, which is very nice. And we saw this in the docs before, but the use awaitable completion token is the one that you use inside of coroutines. So here we have another call to async connect except it uses use awaitable here, allowing the coroutine function to just co-await on its completion. And as I mentioned, the coroutines are tied to the executor that spawned them. And from the inside of a coroutine, you can get a handle to that executor by using co-await on this object. So for example, if you need to start a timer within the coroutine, you start that on the same executor as the coroutine, and then you can use the, the timer as normal with use awaitable. So this is a simple sleep for coroutine that just waits for a duration and then returns. Uh, Casey, I have a question. So I'm having trouble to understand why this uh... I see oh, this coral executor is available. What's the purpose? It's just, it's just get the executor of this object, right? Like why it's available? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I think it's because the the handle is essentially stored in the, the coroutine machinery. And so it's just, not available on the to the the inside of the coroutine and co await as a way to get at the internals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does look a little weird. Yeah. I, I agree. Okay. Thank you. All right. So putting it all together, I have a link to Azio's example programs. Here we have a main function with an IO context. It co-spawns this listener coroutine and then runs. The listener coroutine is just a for loop. It creates an acceptor that listens on a socket and will loop accepting client connections over and over again. So each time that it accepts a connection, it gets the socket for it and co-spawns another coroutine to handle that, that uh, connection. And because co-spawn is asynchronous, it will then just continue on to the next loop and accept the next connection. Where the echo coroutine is just looping over reads and writing the same buffer back and it does this until the connection closes 
it'll get an exception when that happens, print that, and then return. So this very simple example can accept hundreds, thousands of concurrent connections and run all of them from a single thread. And I think that's, uh, I think it captures well the, the power of asynchronous programming. And um, I think coroutines are a very ergonomic way to, to expose this. The code looks very much like normal synchronous functions, except for the co-awaits and use awaitables. So I think this is a good way to kind of scale up uh, asynchronous programs. Any questions on this example? Cool. So to wrap up, I just wanted to highlight some of the existing uses of ASIO. There are links in the gist to source uh, files and directories. The Beast front end in RGW was one of the first major uses. There we create a pool of threads according to the thread pool size configured, and we call IO context run on each of those threads. The front end uses TCP sockets for all of the networking, uses timers for connection timeouts, and it spawns a stack full coroutine to handle each connection. And that, that yield context associated with the stack full coroutine is used as the completion token for any of the asynchronous operations that it issues. More recently in RGW, the D4N cache has started using the Boost Redis connection, which is uh, which follows ASIO's async model. It's a very nice way to, to integrate um, the cache workflow into RGW's request handling. Another big example is the Neo Rados client library. It's essentially a uh, new interface to Librados that's driven by ASIO. And all of the Librados operations take a completion token and so can be used in all of the different contexts that ASIO supports. So the Neo Rados client uh, integrates really well with this coroutine style. Uh, finally, I want to mention the common async directory in Ceph. It's a header-only library of IO objects and async algorithms to help with use of using ASIO and coroutines. Uh, several examples here. Uh, there's, a, there's a max concurrent for each algorithm, a parallel for each algorithm, um, and a few other things that, that help essentially one parent coroutine spawn multiple jobs and wait on, on all of them to complete. Um, so my, my philosophy here is that um, this directory is for kind of the difficult, complicated library code whose goal is to make it really easy for end users in RGW to to use this asynchrony in a, in a nice way. So implementation of IO objects and async functions is outside the scope of this talk, but I would like to do a follow-up talk to go into more detail there. Um, but that concludes my talk. I think we have plenty of time for questions. Um, the, uh, I have a question. This is Igor. Um, I just wanted to take a step back a little bit and uh, because I'm still not sure that I understand this properly, correctly. Uh, the basic idea behind the coroutine that provides you with a way to do like cooperative multi multitasking sort of. So basically you can have unlimited number of coroutines that would be run by a single thread, for example. So that is like a even finer degree of granularity than thread, right? Is that the basic idea behind coroutines? 
Did I get that right? Absolutely right. So the, the main difference is that when you call a synchronous function, for example, to connect to a, a remote TCP server, the thread that you call that on is has to block in between and no other work can be done on that thread in the meantime. Right. With coroutines, whenever you wait on something, you suspend the coroutine. In in ASIO, that's that coroutine is running on some IO context thread. And so by suspending the coroutine, that thread is able to start work on the next job. Um, and that way, a single thread can accomplish much more. OK, so that, that is the where the problem for me is understanding this. So let's say that my coroutine wants to do a, a blocking call. So I should not be doing that on the coroutine because that's going to block the whole thread that's running all the coroutine, right? So I shouldn't be doing any blocking calls from a coroutine. Is that correct? Absolutely right. Yes. And uh, I would say that this is kind of one of the pain points in RGW's migration. We've converted a lot of things to coroutines that suspend, but there are still parts of the code base that run synchronously. And so the only way for us to handle that is to have a large thread pool so that even if some of the operations are blocking their threads, we have enough extra threads to to continue working on other stuff. But the end goal of this work is to get all of the blocking out of these coroutines so that we can run with far fewer threads and use less resources. OK, so just to summarize, as you said, coroutine should not make any blocking calls. So instead, it should should do um, async calls and then immediately hand off uh, the execution to another coroutine so that some time can pass before that coroutine comes back and checks the result of the async operation. Hopefully, by then, it should complete, correct? That's right. Um, so an, an async operation is, is generally starting something and arranging to get notified when it completes. And so that operation would reschedule its completion on the IO context when it's done. And that that uh, completion is, is what would uh, resume the coroutine that was waiting on the result. OK, and the whole idea is that the whole with that is that by the time you know execution comes back to this coroutine, the operation will have completed. So that with the coroutines, we can achieve like a higher CPU utilization with just one thread, something like that. Without the without all the complications of multi-threaded programming. Yeah, I. I, th I think the way I would say it is that you can get a lot more I.O. in flight from a single thread. Um, With coroutines. Yeah. So if, if the coroutines themselves are not really doing I.O., but are just doing a lot of computation, just using the CPU anyway, then you would see less of a benefit from sharing threads this way, right? Right. OK, thank you. And um, yeah, if, if, you, if you are getting enough IO that one thread is having trouble servicing all of it, then, then scaling the number of threads and, and the CPU usage, uh, sp spreading it out, I think, can give a, a lot of benefit, too. Right, but if, so in this case, if you use multiple threads and each of those threads runs multiple coroutines, then ideally, in theory, you should get full CPU utilization, ideally. If you utilize all the hardware threads and they all run coroutines, then you should be maxing out the CPU. Yeah, exactly. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that the IO context and the executor model gives a lot of flexibility to the end user code. You, you essentially just write end user code around an executor 
um, but you might you might run that from a single thread. You might have a thread pool for certain work. Um, it gives a lot of flexibility to the application to say what, what work runs where. Right. And how do we determine um, what number of uh, threads can provide uh, the opti optimal, I mean, for example, performance of the entire system, for example? So. Uh, essentially, just benchmarking at scale, I think. Um, the uh, IBM's Perf and Scale team recently did some measurements around thread counts, and the, the existing default of 512 threads did poorly in comparison to lower thread counts. I think 64 is, was uh, essentially the sweet spot in their workload. But it really depends on the workload, right? If for different scale of clusters, probably the default number, the optimal default number could be different. I think so, yeah. Okay, got it. But uh, yeah, I would, I would say that the reason that we default to 512 is because we want to support a large range of scales, if that makes sense. One thing that uh, we see too is that uh, the thread count matters. The the, the number of threads uh, uh, is the the optimal number of threads is different depending on the workload. So, like deletes versus puts, you may see a different. Uh, a point at which you, you see peak performance. So we'd better like use our own real workload and to benchmark it and to get the 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 like optimum number for ourselves, right? Like it's a it's a basic idea. It's not only the workload itself, but it's a because the traffic pattern also matters. Yeah, there's, um, if you look in the PR here, I was just going to pull it up. Um, it's the, the PR, and you can see both what the Perf and Scale team at IBM did, and then also I've got some results in there from testing that we did at Kleiso. Uh, this is, I don't know, maybe about a year ago that we did this, but you can kind of see how um, the different uh, workloads affect uh, the the throughput. So yeah, there's that's what uh, Perf and Scale did. So they were I think they were just focusing on writes, if I remember right. Is that right, Casey? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, and then farther down, I posted the stuff that we were looking at. There it is. Yeah. So you can kind of see how, um, like, it, as the the thread pool size goes up, the put throughput actually degrades, but uh, delete throughput we actually see scaling better up to like maybe around a hundred threads, and then it. it it still scales a little bit after that, but it kind of hits a, a little bit of a, a plateau. So, so this presumably depends on kind of how well behaved the coroutines are. I mean, if they are kind of synchronously blocking on things, then having higher numbers of threads is going to be better. You know, if they're perfectly behaved and always kind of a weight for asynchronous work, then having one thread per core would, would, would probably be the optimal amount. Yeah, and you can you can kind of see that, Bill, in the, the CPU usage chart, this is the middle one, where yeah. we see that the, for puts, we, we continue to actually uh, use more CPU despite the fact that the performance drops. Right, yeah. I guess, yeah, the... Uh, 
the I guess that first graph, and I had to look at it again, but you can see, yeah, that's the efficiency graph. So the basically the throughput relative to the the cores utilized. So yeah. I mean, I think it reflects the state of the code is in between different models and fleets are probably requiring more CPU from RGW and it's in perfectly balanced work as Bill said, so it's so, so what so it scales more with, with threads are helping it. But but there is a cost to having lots of threads and that's why you know, if we can, as, as the code becomes better optimized, we don't want to have as many. Yeah, yeah. I think I think um, that certainly a uh, combination thread pool polling model is is going to be with a, a much smaller thread count is is the way to go for sure. Yeah. So I'm trying hard to revive the the async refactoring um, project to hunt down and eliminate the rest of the blocking work here. I've made some progress recently. Hope to make a lot more over the T cycle. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll get better results here and um, essentially figure out the, the stalls that Mark found in testing that, that have prevented us from merging this. Yeah, were they how remind me again, Casey, how bad were the stalls that you saw? Did Mark say there? Uh 99th there was a stall of 79 seconds. Whew. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty extreme. Hard to explain even just from a thread blocking on something. Yeah, that sounds like I mean you know, the, the, the me I thought is resharding, but I, I assume Mark probably didn't was like accounting for that. But no, these were gets, not puts. Huh. Wow. I, I will say I, I don't recall seeing anything like that in the testing I've done. I I wonder if it's something unrelated. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in following up on this. His testing was with 128 threads. Um, in the meantime, maybe we see benefits without these stalls with more like 192 or 256 maybe. Could be worth experimenting just in the short term. Yeah, I, for, for what it's worth, our, our downstream stuff that we're making is going to use um, 128. We're basing it on this, the, the defaults you guys chose here. I think this is 128, right? Or is it 64 that Mark set in this BR? Let's see. Uh, it was 128. Yeah. Yeah, 128. Yeah, we just used this. So uh, hope, hopefully we'll have some, some information for you if anyone really sees it in the wild. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all I've got. Uh, uh, oh, another question. Yeah, one more question. Sorry. Uh, so I'd like to uh, know a little more of uh, of uh, like C plus twenty coroutine adoption plan. Is it gonna only happen on multi site replication, or gonna do that for the client traffic handling, client request handling as well? What's the plan? Uh, right, we, we are prototyping um, metadata sync for multi-site using this coroutine style. Um, 
elsewhere in RGW, Adam's already opened a data log PR that makes use of these coroutines a lot. So um, you use a C plus plus twenty style, right? Like uh, available stuff. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, th I think ideally it would be nice to use them for front end requests also. Um, but I think getting there is, is going to be difficult. Um, this, the strategy that we've been using so far is the optional yield, which wraps the, the stack full coroutines yield context. Um, and the, the fact that that's optional means is how we uh, incrementally make progress in converting synchronous things to async with C++ 20 coroutines. Um, we, we can't really have the, the optional asynchrony there in the same way. Uh, why we want to m migrate at all? So is there any like disadvantage of those are like stack for coroutine stuff? Why? Or like stack list coroutine, those older, older cell? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I do think there are trade-offs there. One of the, I guess one of the downsides of stackful coroutines is that we have to allocate a fairly big stack for each one up front. Um, initially, we, the stack wasn't big enough and we were seeing um, stack overflows that were really tough to debug. So we converted to stacks that were allocated by mmap and protected with mprotect. And those system calls add some overhead to every request. So I think stackless coroutines could eliminate that overhead. OK, got it. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be really cool if we ever get there. I hope we will. Maybe Mark remembers how big of a cost that was. It might have been like 2 or 3%. Which, sorry, which uh, one? Um, we changed the, the type of coroutine stack several years ago to one that used mmap and mprotect. And I remember uh, you tracking that as a performance yeah. regression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got that shown somewhere. Um, one of the performance articles. But that's not versus stackless, right? That was versus that was versus the pre-allocated thread stack, I think. Yes, you're right. We we decided to pay that cost just for the safety of against stack overflows. I think it I think it was one of these two commits maybe that uh, are in the URL I just posted at the in the introduction part. If you want to take a look at that one, see if I can figure out which commit those two were. Um, spreadsheet. Uh, Sorry, Marcel, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Um, I, I have a question about debugging this stuff. Um, so when I have like a regular, like non-async program, um, stack, stack traces are like meaningful. It can take like my threads, get stack trace and know like what happened after what somehow. But if I have an async program, um, I basically have like, for example, one thread that runs this executor thing. And uh, if I understand it correctly, jumps around between different things. Um, is there like a tool or to like unwind that to, for example, tell the executor, give me all those call chains that are somehow happening here and where they came from? Or is that basically lost after a while? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you, you definitely lose the ability to see concise stack traces uh, with, with async code. 
because everything is essentially being resumed by the the IO context, and so you see a bunch of its stack rather than the coroutine that called the coroutine that you're in, right? Mm -hmm. is, is there already tools to to uh, to to unwind uh, async code? I, I think like a while ago I read that for Python things like that are in development, but I have no idea if that that's still uh, already there and how things look like in C++ land. And does this have like an impact on uh, profiling? Uh, oh, cool. Profiling, I don't, I don't really think so because it's still showing where most of the CPU time is. Uh, and that's, I think that's more likely to be in, um, in the the bottom. But yeah, this this GitHub repo has some uh, extensions for GDB and LLDB that can give you a backtrace of the coroutine calls. I haven't I haven't tried it myself, but I have it bookmarked because it looks really useful. Oh yeah, it does. Can you post the link? Please. Thank you. TC, I, um, I saw two regressions that I remember. One was for um, this like CMake workaround set boost component found and RGW add more spawn linking somewhere around that. Um, it was this one. And then there was this other one. Uh, this is the one that I remember that we fixed, but I don't think it's what you're talking about. This is the boost timeout stuff. Yeah, those are the two main regressions that I remember. One was the the timeout logic that we tried using from the Beast library. Yeah. I ended up rewriting that just with raw ASIO timers and reduced a lot of CPU usage. And the other one I do remember being the um, the coroutine stack allocation. Oh, OK. Yeah, I couldn't remember the details on it, but that's right. Uh, uh, you're saying that. OK. So that was 0, F, 4, CB, et cetera, et cetera, that first one. Uh, the first one looks like the Beast front end uses 512k M protected coroutine stacks. Yeah, okay. That was actually a, a fairly, you know, moderately to fairly significant performance loss for GETs, but it, um, and yeah, I guess, I guess CPU usage as well. It wasn't as dramatic though as the, the second, the second was the one that really, really was bad. Okay, I, I, I had that graph uh, in the other link, but here's the spreadsheet that actually has all the, the, the whole performance by section for that. Don't have access. Oh, sorry. Let me share that. Uh, yeah. Okay. It should be. It should be good now. All right. So we're coming up on the hour. I don't want to keep people too long. Any any final questions before we wrap up? 
I didn't see the beginning of your talk, Casey, but I, I got I was able to make it for the last half of it. It looks looks really good. All right. Well, uh, I am recording, and I'll upload that for YouTube, so you can catch the beginning too. Oh, thank you. That'd be great. <laughs>